What does it feel like to be jacked? Well, I can tell you in a single word. It feels incredible. Being very strong and taking up a lot of physical space changes the entire way you feel about yourself and the way that others perceive you as well. Suddenly, you become a physical presence and people can't help but sit up and take notice. You become indomitable, immovable and powerful and as a result, everything you say has more weight and more gravity to it. People listen. Bulking changes other things too. When you feel that powerful and you notice the way people start treating you, you can't help but feel far more confident too. This changes the way you walk, the way you hold yourself and the way that you present yourself. You walk like someone unstoppable and that only increases that sense of presence. And then there are all the direct practical ways that gaining muscle changes your life. You start to win play fights with your mates, you become better at sports and people start asking you to help them lift things. You know, it's just a great feeling to be thought of as someone capable and powerful, you know, instead of being the little guy who's the butt of jokes all the time. And being jacked also helps you get attention from the opposite sex. You look amazing in all your clothes, you can fill out a suit and your arms pop from white vests, and all that power and confidence is simply highly attractive to people. You even find that you start getting your way more in work and in the rest of your life as people start to take you more seriously. That and physical prowess correlates with improved brain power, so you can expect to start thinking better too. But maybe you're not bothered about all that. Maybe you're simply looking for a way to bulk up so you can become stronger and better at your sport. Or perhaps you're a bodybuilder. Whatever the case, this video series is going to act as your ultimate guide. Here you'll find everything you could possibly need to know in order to grow and you'll be given simple straightforward steps that you can follow to do that. And the difference this time is we're going to organize it all in a way that actually works. No more half-hearted attempts and no more disappointments. The science is simple, all we have to do is put it into practice. This is really a science and not an art. The way you go about building muscle is very simple and once you know the formula, it's a simple matter of following it through to completion. There's no mystery to this formula either, it's something athletes have been using for decades. What we're going to do a bit differently though, is adapt that bodybuilding formula and make it a little more adaptable so you can fit it around your busy schedule. Here's what you'll learn specifically. What your genetic potential for gaining muscle is. How to eat for bulk. How to fit your eating plan around your lifestyle. How to eat big while saving money. The secret to staying relatively lean while bulking. How to increase your strength massively. The optimum amount of training and way to train for building muscle. How to dress to look stronger. How to focus on the muscles that will create the biggest visual impact and strength gains. How to train and bulk from home. The best supplements for accelerating growth. And much more. So get ready. Let's do this. Before we dive into how you're going to bulk, the first thing we need to do is to address your current state. That means we'll be looking at your current muscle mass, your height and how much muscle you're likely to gain. We'll also be looking at the metabolic demands of your body which will tell us how many calories you'll burn in a given day. That's going to be very important for building muscle as we'll see in a moment. So for now we're going to start by assessing you in your current condition. We'll find some numbers to put your name to and while it might seem a little random, stick with it. In the videos that follow, these numbers are going to serve as your guide. Knowing yourself is crucial when it comes to gaining muscle. So first, let's calculate your current body fat percentage and lean mass. Finding out how much you weigh is very easy. All you need to do is step on a set of scales and you'll be given a precise number denoting your weight. But that on its own is not a particularly useful metric because it doesn't actually tell you anything about your muscle. 
anyone can be big, they just had to eat huge amounts of cake. But you're not trying to get fat, you're trying to get jacked. And that means you're interested in adding muscle and it's why you need to know just how much of your current mass is muscle already. So to do this, you're going to step yourself onto a set of scales and get your weight in pounds. Okay, done that. Right. I'm 176.4 pounds at 5 foot 8 by the way, so I'll be playing along with you. Now you need to work out your body fat percentage. This is the percentage of that weight that is accounted for by subcutaneous fat, and that's the fat underneath your skin. And finding this number is fortunately very easy. All you need to do is to measure the thickness of your skin, which will include that layer of fat. To do this, you need to grab a pinch of skin from the side of the tricep. So this is the spot midway between your shoulder and elbow on the outside of your arm around from the bicep. And then you want to use this chart to get your current body fat percentage. So you want to get your skin fold thickness in millimeters and that is going to give you a rough idea of your body fat percentage and you'll notice here from this chart that the percentages are different for men and women. And this is a rough estimate of course, but you can also get an idea by looking at photos of people at different body fat percentages. If you can see abs but aren't covered in ripped veins, then you're probably between 13 and 10% body fat. If you can see all the striations and the veins, then you're sub 10%. Find a number that you think is a fair estimate and then subtract that percentage from your current body weight to find out what you would weigh if all of your body fat were to be removed. If you weighed 100 pounds and your body fat percentage were 10%, then you would have a lean mass of 90 pounds. Now, for me, that number is 158.76 pounds because I had 10% body fat, well, approximately. Now it's actually possible to get some more very interesting information from these numbers, which is your FFMI. That is your fat-free mass index, which is like a body mass index, but a lot more accurate because it differentiates between muscle and fat. And what's more, there is an upper limit to what your FFMI can be naturally without using steroids or other performance-enhancing drugs. And this is good because it lets us see just how much stronger we can get. To work out your FFMI, all you need to do is use this equation. FFMI equals your LBM in kilograms divided by your height in meters squared. So convert your lean body mass to kilograms, then divide it by the square of your height in meters. So when I do this with my numbers, I get a score of 23.065. The maximum it is generally agreed that you can score here is about 25. Any higher than that, and people will, perhaps rightly, suspect that you may be using steroids. This was the finding according to one study that surveyed a lot of natural athletes to see where they would peak. This is your genetic limit, and beyond that, you'll only really be able to add fat. It's not a perfect score though, and some individuals generally have been able to break through and go even further beyond, a you know, Dragon Ball Z quote, even without steroids. But as a rule, this is how far you can expect to go. So if I have an FFMI of 23.065 and the maximum is 25, that means I have achieved 92.26% of my genetic potential. Work out how close you are to achieving yours and you can start to picture just how much bigger you could potentially get. Know this though, the closer you start to get to your genetic limit, the harder it will become to add on more muscle. This is why experienced athletes can often be quite jealous of beginners who still experience noob gains. But it's good news if you're currently very skinny because it means you'll be able to really start piling on the pounds quickly with the right regimen. With that out of the way, we can finally work out your AMR and BMR. So, what exactly are these numbers? Well, your BMR is your basal metabolic rate. This is just how much energy, in calories, your body needs in order to live. This is assuming you're not moving at all, you're just lying there. 
Your body will still need to use that energy simply to maintain your systems, you know, to help you blink, breathe, digest and pump blood around your body. Your AMR is this number plus the number of calories you're burning through movement and exercise. When you combine those two things, what you're left with is the total energy demand of your body on an average day. This in turn tells you just how much you need to eat if you want to avoid burning fat and how much you need to eat if you want to encourage burning fat. Because if you were trying to lose weight, then you would need to remain on a calorie deficit. That would mean you'd be eating fewer calories than you burn throughout the day. As a result, your body will be forced to burn fat in order to fuel your various movements or just to keep your heart beating. But you're not trying to lose weight. In fact, you're trying to gain weight, albeit a certain kind, and that means you need to maintain a caloric surplus where you consume more calories in the day than you use up. This in turn will mean that your body then has extra calories to spare and it will most likely store those calories as fat around the body or use them to build muscle or provide you with fuel to move around with. You don't want to go too far into surplus or you'll end up looking huge and blobby while also breaking out in bouts of acne. Instead, you need to go just far enough into surplus and that's why you need to get scientific and you need to calculate precisely how many calories you need and how many you're eating. There are numerous equations for calculating BMR, but the one we're going to use is based on your lean body mass. Now, this is very important because muscle is more metabolically active than fat. If you are very heavy due to a lot of muscle, then you'll burn more calories simply to maintain and operate all that muscle mass. So the equation looks like this. BMR equals 370 plus brackets 9.79757519 multiplied by LBM in pounds. So when I take my 162.288 and put that in, I get a BMR of 1960. This means if I just lay there all day, I would lose weight unless I ate at least 1,960 calories, or kcal. Now let's add in activity. And this is going to be something of a rough estimate, but this following list should help. 1.2, if you're sedentary, that means you get little or no exercise. 1.375, if you're slightly active, in other words, you exercise one to three times a week. 1.55 if you're moderately active or you exercise or work out without average. 1.725 if you're very active, in other words you train hard for six or seven days a week or you do a job that requires a lot of time on your feet. And 1.9 if you're highly active, you know, you're a physical laborer or a professional athlete. If you feel you're somewhere in the middle, then guesstimate the number that's somewhere in the middle. Unfortunately, there's never a way to be absolutely sure. I'm probably around 1.6 as I train a lot, but I'm certainly not a professional athlete or a physical laborer. So that gives me an AMR of 2,488, which is actually quite average for a male. The average is generally thought to be about 2,500. Calculate yours and now you have your AMR. Note that there are other ways you can calculate your calorie expenditure too. One example is simply to wear a good fitness tracker that includes a heart rate monitor. Some good examples include the Fitbit Surge, the Charge HR, the Microsoft Band 2 or the Garmin VOActive HR. If you're watching this a few years in the future, then probably there are better models out there by now. Either way, a fitness tracker works by using an optical sensor on the wrist to measure your heart rate throughout the day. The best models will take regular readings and combine this with information you entered about yourself and movement data picked up from a pedometer, gyroscope and accelerometer. When all this information is collated, you can then be given a rough calorie burn estimate for any given day. The other great thing is that you can sync this with MyFitnessPal, which is a smartphone app and website where you can log everything you eat. 
This lets you see your total calories in and out and will adjust the number whenever you go on a long walk or do a workout or perhaps have a day where you move very little. And by comparing these two numbers, you can make sure you stay in that surplus. If it's 11 p.m. and you haven't been too active and haven't eaten much, you know you need to get busy and down some bulking powder. So we've gone through all we did in the last video, just to get your calorie burnt for the day. But this is absolutely crucial because maintaining a calorie surplus is going to be the single most important factor when it comes to bulking. As long as you're eating more than you're burning, then you will get bigger over time. So just why is a calorie surplus so important? Well, the first and most obvious reason is that building muscle requires energy. You're asking your body to construct new tissue from the protein in your diet, and that means you're going to need to eat more to provide that energy. The other reason is you're trying to prevent the breakdown of muscle. When you're low on energy and your body is forced to burn fat, it goes into a catabolic state. First, your body notices your stomach is empty. This causes a release of ghrelin, the hunger hormone. That in turn triggers the release of cortisol, the stress hormone, which is designed to encourage your brain to go and seek out food. Your body is now in a catabolic state where it will burn fat and use it for fuel. But that cortisol also triggers the release of something else, myostatin. Myostatin is one of the single biggest enemies of bodybuilders because it tells the body to break down muscle. Muscle is very energy demanding and not very energy efficient. As we've seen, simply having muscle increases your BMR. Thus, if you're starving and your body is low on the sugars and ATP it needs to run, it's going to want to break down muscle and certainly not prioritize it for building. What's more, this will release some additional energy that your body can use. So being in a calorie deficit puts you in an anxious, skinny, lean and efficient mode. Conversely though, when you eat large amounts of calories, it lets your muscles swell up because you're creating the right environment. Your body will store some of that energy as glycogen you know, right in the muscle cells and make them look even bigger. And when you provide the correct stimulus for growth, your system will respond by building. This is also why rest is so important and why you need to train without exhausting yourself. The goal of training is not to burn calories, just to provide stimulus for growth. You're aiming to get pumped in the gym and then spend the rest of the time eating and resting. I call this living like a lion. So the next question is just how many calories you actually need in order to bulk. Obviously, this is dependent on the AMR as we've just worked out. But how many more calories than that should you aim for? The answer again varies and is dependent on various factors, such as whether you're more interested in a lean bulk, meaning that you add muscle with very little body fat, or a dirty bulk, meaning that you add both muscle and fat. A very clean bulk is achievable with something like 150 to 200 calories a day. A slightly clean bulk is around 2 to 300, and if you want a dirty bulk, you could go up to 400 to 450. Higher than that though, and you're starting to get into fat territory. You're going to place a bit of strain on your body and potentially cause acne and other problems, and this can also be unhealthy. So, which should you choose? Well, if you're someone who's very skinny and you're just starting out, you can go for a pretty dirty bulk with a surplus of 300 to 400 calories. Because right now, you're probably in a position where you want to be a lot stronger. You may have tried to bulk in the past and been disappointed. But at the same time, you're a noob, which means you have the potential for noob gains. In other words, you have the potential to bulk up and fast if that's what you want to do. And in your current situation, it probably is what you want to do as well. Later on, you can do a short cutting cycle in order to bring your body fat back down and reveal the definition and striations. Conversely, if you're someone who's an average size right now, perhaps a mesomorph, 
then you may well be a little stocky but also carrying around a bit more fat than you want. If you're already at around 12 to 15 percent body fat then you'll probably want to avoid adding too much extra and so in that case you'll do better to bulk a little slower without so much excess. And finally, if you're someone who is at or around their genetic potential or you're someone who is already in good shape, then a clean bulk is the safest way to go. In this video, I want to talk about macros. And no, it's got nothing to do with programs that run automatically on your computer. In bodybuilding circles, there's a diet called IIFYM. This stands for if it fits your macros and it essentially means that you can eat anything you like as long as you eat within certain parameters. The concept began life on forums like bodybuilding.com, in fact as a response to a lot of inane questions. People were repeatedly asking, can I eat donuts or can I eat chicken with the skin on? And the answer would always be yes if it fits in your macros. This was eventually shortened to IIFYM, as a joke as much as anything, which eventually evolved to become practically a diet in and of itself, the IIFYM diet. This is broadly speaking the diet that we're going to be following in order to bulk. However, there are certain caveats as we're also going to see. So perhaps the best place to start is, what is a macro? Essentially, a macro is a macronutrient, which is effectively another term for a food group. Macronutrients include protein, carbohydrates and fats, and together these effectively make up your caloric intake. We don't count fiber because fiber doesn't contain any calories, you know, it just passes straight through. Protein and carbs both count for 4 calories per gram, so if you eat 10 grams of protein, that is 40 calories. Fat, meanwhile, contains 9 calories per gram. Seeing as you know that you can eat, let's say, 2,700 calories, then this means you want to work backwards in order to decide how much of that is going to consist of protein, carbs and fats, respectively. And the answer to this is going to depend, once again, on various aspects regarding your biology. Let's take a look. Now, when it comes to building muscle, the most important thing is that you're eating a lot of protein. Protein is basically meat and plant matter, you know, carbon, and this is broken down to create amino acids. You may have heard that we are carbon-based life forms, which basically tells you that humans are made from carbon. So when you consume protein, you're eating literally the building blocks that compose your body. This means protein can help you to repair cuts and bruises, to rejuvenate skin cells, to grow and, crucially, to grow muscle. Thus begins the cycle of muscle building. You work out to break down your muscle fiber and then you provide your body with rest and with protein which allows it to restore it again and build it back up. If you're not getting the protein, then you're not providing your body with what it needs to restore muscle, and that means you won't grow. In fact, you'll just become weaker. So now the question becomes, how much protein do you need? And fortunately, you have a very easy and simple answer for that question. One gram of protein for every pound of body weight. So if you weigh 170 pounds, you need to eat 170 grams of protein. This will net you 680 calories, which means you now have 2,020 calories left to divide between fats and carbohydrates. Why one gram for each pound? Well, that's simply what has been shown to be optimal in studies. Countless studies have looked at this question, and all of them have found that this amount leads to the optimal amount of muscle growth. And you can, of course, go above this number, heading closer to 1.2 or 1.3 grams, which is around 884 calories. But this will start to reach the point of diminishing returns. So now the question is where you'll get your energy from. And the answer is that it again partly depends on you and your aims. 
Of course, the objective is always going to be minimizing fat gain while maximizing muscle gain. And in that regard, there are two schools of thought. One is that you should eat more carbs and less saturated fat. The other is that you should eat more saturated fat and fewer carbs. Tricky. So perhaps it's best if we assess each stance. Those who favour saturated fat do so because they believe it will minimise weight gain. It can do this because saturated fat is a slow-release form of energy. That is to say, it takes a long time for the body to break it down and use it as energy. This means it will slowly release energy into your bloodstream, thereby enabling you to go for longer without snacking and prevent you from getting a sudden sugar spike. The concern with carbs is that they quickly release their energy into the body, causing a sudden spike in blood sugar, which is in turn immediately followed by a spike in insulin. That insulin causes the body to use up all of the available glucose in the blood, thereby leaving you feeling exhausted and drained. This is one reason that we often feel sleepy after we've eaten. Saturated fat also has a lot of health benefits, you know, the good kind, because it aids with nutrient absorption, helping you get the goodness from your foods, and it encourages the production of testosterone, because testosterone is made from cholesterol. It's good for the brain, and in general, it's a mistake to leave it out of the diet. Carbs, on the other hand, and specifically simple white carbs, tend to be processed, man-made food with lots of sugar. These are empty calories that don't provide any nutritional value and thus they aren't terribly good for the body. But on the other hand, a lot of bodybuilders prefer to choose carbs as the dominant macro in their diet. This is because carbs are the body's preferred energy source. That means if you eat a lot of carbs, they're more likely to be used for energy during workouts and movements rather than being stored as fat. They also contain fewer calories in total, meaning you can eat more of them without gaining lots of weight. Some people go as far as to believe that they can effectively eat large amounts of carbs without really gaining too much excess body fat, and see Vitruvian Physique's YouTube video on the subject. And there's more here too, because carbs are actually the preferred energy source of fast twitch muscle fiber. Fast twitch muscle fiber, as opposed to slow twitch, the other type, is the type of muscle fiber that is used for powerful explosive movements such as sprinting or lifting heavy objects. As it happens, fast twitch muscle fiber is also thicker than slow twitch, meaning that a muscle composed of more fast twitch will be bigger. On the other hand, the body prefers triglycerides, fats, when it comes to exercise that requires you to exert yourself over a long duration. This is true for jogging, for example, and for walking long distances. And that's the reason why running is so great for burning lots of fat and getting slimmer. You want fast twitch muscle fiber, so it makes sense to fuel it with carbs. Note that not all carbs release sugar quickly. Slow carbs or complex carbs release energy much more slowly. These are carbs that also contain a lot of fiber and or fat, and good examples include green vegetables, new potatoes, whole wheat bread, brown pasta, etc. It's also important to note that not all carbs are empty calories. In fact, some carbs are highly nutrient dense, and a good example of this is fruit. Fruit is a carb and it happens to be a fantastic source of vitamins, minerals and more. These have a ton of great health benefits which can help with bulking and are just generally very desirable. They can boost testosterone, prevent muscle breakdown, give you more energy, help you to sleep better and more. So if the arguments are so compelling, what should you do? Well, the answer is A, to find out what works best for you, and B, find some kind of compromise. Personally, I split my macros roughly evenly between carbs and fats. So now you can see how IIFYM works. Can you eat donuts and still build lean muscle? Sure you can. 
as long as it fits your macros. But there's a problem here and that problem is it can lead to people eating some seriously unhealthy diets. Some people think, I can eat donuts and still get into shape? Great, then that's all I'm going to eat. The only problem with this strategy is you're only consuming simple sugars and you're only consuming processed man-made food. This means you won't be getting any vitamin C, D, A, B, E, and you won't be getting any omega-3 fatty acids, any CoQ10, any magnesium, potassium, calcium, zinc, iron. You get the picture. All of these things have important and crucial roles in the body and can help us to improve the look of our skin, the strength of our bones, our brain power, our immune system, our hormones, and much, much more. Think of the people you know who eat nothing but junk food. They're probably either badly overweight or spotty with bad hair and nails. This is not conductive to building muscle. And thus, it's also highly important to get your micronutrients. And that means you need to be eating fruits, vegetables, fish, nuts, and more. This is what will allow your body to operate optimally. And in turn, it's what will ensure that you can build as much muscle as possible and also maintain the best possible health. An easy rule for this is to try and go paleo. Paleo is another popular diet which involves eating only foods that would have grown naturally. These are the foods our bodies have evolved to thrive on and they include tons of nutrients. So the simple rule is that if you couldn't hunt or forage it, you can't eat it. Paleo is quite a strict diet though, especially if you combine it with IIFYM, you know, just try ordering anything in a restaurant. And if you're trying to get lots of calories from carbs, it does help to be able to eat bread, pasta and rice. So instead, my version of this diet is the agricultural diet. You can eat anything that would be in the paleo diet, plus anything that could be grown or made on a farm. And of course, I'm very relaxed with that because I do sometimes fancy an ice cream or some chocolate and my macros allow for that. So why not? It's not that you can't eat processed foods, it's that you must eat the other stuff. And when you do, you'll feel and perform much better, leading to better muscle mass. So just be aware of this difference. Seek out complex carbs rather than simple carbs, eat lots of fruit and veg, and keep the processed foods and empty calories to a minimum, and, you know, and make them treats. We haven't gotten to the exercises you need to do yet, but that's because we've put things here in order of importance. Bulking is done predominantly in the kitchen, with the gym being an afterthought, not the other way around. As long as you're eating a calorie surplus and getting your grams of protein, then you will find you're able to grow and bulk up and even add some muscle. But some of you have probably tried eating a lot in the past and found it didn't work. So the question now becomes, why not? If you've calculated your AMR, your macros and your regular calorie intake and you're maintaining a surplus, how can you not be growing? You can ask this question on a forum and depending on where you ask, they'll tell you you're wrong. It's simple math, they say. If you eat more calories than you burn, it has to go somewhere and you will grow, they say. If you're not growing, you can't be eating enough calories. Are you skipping meals? But what they fail to take into account here is individual differences and just how much your AMR can vary depending on your hormonal makeup and other factors. You can run the numbers all you want and wear fitness trackers, but there are certain things that they just can't tell you. This is something a lot of people who swear by calorie counting and IIFYM deny. They snort in derision at people who say that eating a low-carb diet is a useful way to manage insulin, for example. But if you need proof that this does play a role, you just have to look at someone who uses steroids. 
Someone who uses steroids will build much more muscle and burn much more fat while doing the exact same routine as someone who doesn't use them, although they'd also suffer lots of other side effects. However, if they were to put their numbers in as we had done earlier, their AMR would be the exact same. Steroids work by increasing testosterone, you know, by binding to the androgen receptors. Now imagine what happens if you have low testosterone. And as it happens, a lot of guys do have low testosterone, which leads to them being weak, flabby and overweight. Conversely, you might struggle to gain weight if you have a condition like hyperthyroidism. This is a genetic disorder that causes your metabolism to be very fast. It makes you anxious, jittery and thin, and it's all to do with your balance of T3 and T4 hormones. It's also possible to have hypothyroidism, you know, note the O, which is the opposite effect and it makes you tired, lethargic and overweight, while also causing problems like acne. In women, hypothyroidism can be the result of polycystic ovaries. What's my point? Simply that you might be trying to bulk and not understanding why it's not working, You're only to be eventually diagnosed with hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism. And in that case, you wouldn't be able to change size and shape, but you also wouldn't know why you had that problem. Likewise, you could have low testosterone but not realize it and carry on in vain trying to gain more muscle mass. But even if you don't have either of these conditions, there's a good chance that you could have some kind of imbalance or deficit that leads to similar problems. It's actually a mistake to think of your body too much in terms of being ill or well. In reality, our systems are not binary, they're spectrums. You don't have low testosterone or high testosterone. You have a number somewhere between those two extremes. What's more is that your testosterone levels are constantly fluctuating throughout the day. You know, after you exercise, after you eat, while you sleep, when you're stressed, during sex. And they fluctuate more or less for different people. The same goes for insulin, myostatin, cortisol, T4 etc. So you might not have hyperthyroidism, but you might be borderline. You could have a very high metabolism that still falls within the normal range. No one is going to prescribe you any medication, and yet your attempts to bulk would likely be met with failure. So what do you do? Well, the best strategy you have is to try and change your hormonal makeup for the better, while at the same time carefully monitoring your results and adjusting your approach. Not gaining any weight with that 300 calorie surplus? Then you probably have a very fast metabolism that you're not picking up on, meaning your surplus probably isn't really a surplus. Try increasing that number. Meanwhile, you can slow down your metabolism with the way you eat. Continuously supplying yourself with complex carbs will do that, as will your training if you keep it up. The rest of the time, it can try to help and minimize stress, which contributes to a faster metabolism by raising cortisol, adrenaline, and noadrenaline. And believe it or not, running long distance or going on a walk can also help. Why? because this will help you to develop more cardio strength. In doing that, you can lower your resting heart rate, which will actually send signals to your brain that makes you feel calmer. When you do this, you can then keep your cortisol lower throughout the day. Likewise, if you're someone who struggles to lose weight, then you should try going low carb. This will force your body to learn to prefer fats as an energy source, which in turn will help with your weight loss. It'll also avoid those insulin spikes that make you hungry and lead to more fat storage. At the same time, try doing HIIT, which uses up all of the sugar in the bloodstream and muscles through intense bursts of energy and forces you to turn on your fat stores. Another thing to think about 
is the peaks and troughs in your metabolism and when the best time to eat it. If you want your carbs to go to your muscle, then you need to consume them when your glycogen stores are lowest, right after you've trained, and that's called carb backloading. Likewise, if you want to build muscle overnight, then consuming a slow-release form of protein, such as casein, is a good idea because it will help you to have all the protein you need just when you're in deepest levels of sleep. 4am is the time when the body maximizes its production of testosterone and of growth hormone, which are anabolic hormones that tell the body to build muscle. In the morning when you wake up, your blood sugar is low because you've gone all night without eating. This is great for losing weight, but terrible for building muscle. So if you want to avoid it being a negative thing, you need to get some calories in you early to get out of that highly catabolic state. As you can see then, you shouldn't think only in the short term and ask yourself to quickly add lots of calories to your diet. You should also think in the long term and think about how what you're eating will change your body and help you to build more muscle over time by slowing down your metabolism. But the simplest way to start bulking for most people is going to be to maintain a surplus. For most people, that's more than sufficient and the AMR will be accurate. It's only when this fails that you then need to think about ways you can slow down your metabolism and or increase your surplus further. And you need to monitor your results as you do that to see what's working. So keep those scales out. Sorry, I just couldn't resist the temptation to use two acronyms like that right next to each other as the title of this video. Of course, IRL stands for in real life, and what I'm talking about here is how you're going to get all of these concepts to work in the real world. How can you take that concept and make it work as a part of your routine? It's all well and good telling you to eat all these calories and to eat loads of protein, but where can you find these things? How can you afford it? And how can you force it all down without wanting to throw up? In other words, you need to find ways to make this actually practical so that it will work with your routine. And to do that, you need to get strategic. This is incredibly important and it's the thing people all too often forget. If you're trying to bulk up, you need to find a way to stick to your training and your diet. That means it needs to be realistic. It's better to have very modest gains and actually stick to them than it is to be incredibly ambitious and end up not doing any of the things that you set out to do. So let's consider some tips that will help you out. The majority of your results will come from your diet. Supplements are just that, supplements. They should be supplemental to a good diet and never viewed as a substitute for one. So the question is, what kind of foods can you eat that will satisfy all the criteria we've been looking at in the videos so far? What will help you to keep your protein and calories high while also being nutritionally dense and slow release? What leaner sources of protein are there for when you're trying to lean bulk? Well, here are some foods that will help you a great deal. The first is tuna. Tuna is one of the most convenient options when it comes to finding lean sources of protein. Canned tuna is very affordable while containing 20 grams or more of tuna in many cases. It's lean, it's versatile and it's tasty too. Plus, it's also good for the brain thanks to that omega-3 fatty acid content. The only downside? Well, consuming too much can risk a potential mercury overdose. Not good. Salmon is not quite as low in calories as tuna, you know, a good thing for bulking, but it's just as high in protein and omega-3 fatty acid. The better news? Well, it doesn't have the mercury problem. The downside? It's much more expensive. Then there's avocado. These are all the rage among the low-carb crowd at the moment, which is owing to their delicious taste their healthy fats and their large range of other health benefits. 
They're quite calorific, but healthy at the same time, so they make a great way to add more calories and fat to pretty much any meal. Adding sunflower or vegetable oil to your food isn't actually bad for you, but it does contain a lot of calories, which is another really good way to sneak them in when you're starting to feel full and struggle to keep eating more. Eggs are high in protein, as well as the healthy saturated fats and choline, which is great for the brain. The best part about eggs, though, is that they are a complete protein. This means they contain all of the essential amino acids the human body needs to function. There are very few complete protein sources in the world, so this makes eggs pretty special. Sweet potatoes are a good source of carbs and also nutritious and high in slow-release complex carbs. Chicken is another very lean protein source and this time it doesn't come with any significant downsides. You can eat chickens until the cows come home. And cows until the chickens come home? Well, beef is also an excellent source of protein which is partly due to some very interesting additional nutrients it contains. Specifically, beef is actually one of the only natural sources of coenzyme Q10 and of creatine, both of which give you more energy and drive during your workouts. If you're looking for a carb that's fairly easy to eat in bulk, then rice is a good bet. Nuts are also great. Not only do these provide fiber, but they're also a very good source of protein, calories, and good fats. They also provide various micronutrients like zinc, selenium, and magnesium. Milk is one of the very best things you can keep around the house if you're bulking, and especially full fat milk. Remember, milk is where whey protein comes from, and when you drink milk, you're still getting a lot of that whey in there. In fact, a glass of milk contains 3.4 grams of protein, while full fat milk is widely considered one of the very best things you can drink if you want to give yourself more healthy fats. Then there's butter. And a good butter is another very useful tool for packing on more calories. Wish your food was a little more calorific? Then just butter it up. You can even try the bulletproof coffee that everyone's talking about by dropping a stick of butter into your morning brew. Oats are great at adding more stodge and at giving you more slow-release energy. Add these to a shake and they'll increase the calories while also helping you have more energy for work, play and workouts. You should also try GoMad. Now, have you tried absolutely everything to bulk up with no success? Not sure where to turn? You know, it's enough to make you go mad, or at least go mad. Go mad stands for gallon of milk a day, and it's considered the last chance saloon when all else has failed. As the name rather implies, this is a method of eating that has just one simple rule. You have to drink a whole gallon of milk every single day. When you do this, you'll find it's enough to help you pack on muscle thanks to the huge amounts of protein, calories, and saturated fat. It can greatly increase your testosterone and your growth hormone, amongst other things, and some reports suggest that it's nearly as effective as a steroid cycle if you're new. Of course, it also carries some health risks, and it's not a good idea to consume anything in massive quantities normally. So if you're going to try this method, the key is to get in and out quickly. One of the best things you can possibly do to improve your chances of bulking success is simply to find a convenient place where you can get lots of calories without spending too much or breaking from your usual routine. A salad bar is a great place to find this as they tend to be all you can eat while also serving up eggs, pasta and other good stuff for your bulking goals. They tend to be pretty cheap as well. One of the single most useful things you can do to make tracking your calorie intake that bit easier is just to stay consistent. In other words, have a few meals you eat regularly and that way you'll know exactly the calories and macros you're getting without having to do the math every time or input them anew. 
it might not be terribly exciting, but this is a big help. You can of course log all of your calories in a diary or notebook, but this is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. Instead then, consider logging your calories using the excellent app MyFitnessPal. This will allow you to scan everything you eat barcode and the site will then automatically fill in all the details for you. And you can read more about it at myfitnesspal.com. Supplements can greatly help in your bid to build muscle and size, and they're a great way to get your protein, nutrients, and more. Your diet is still number one, but it definitely doesn't hurt to add a few of the right supplements too. And this would hardly be a complete bulking video series without at least touching on a few. Of course, the big one here is going to be protein shake. The most popular form of protein shake is called whey protein, and this is a byproduct of the cheese making process that comes from milk. It's a lean source of protein, and it also has good bioavailability, basically meaning that your body can use it. When you buy whey protein, it'll come in the form of a shake that you can easily mix with water. It's a tasty treat, and it's actually very affordable, and you can drink it anywhere you are. It's lean too, so ideal for those who are trying a lean bulk, and it doesn't cost that much compared with eating lots of meat. What all this means is whey protein provides one of the most convenient methods available for getting the amount of protein you need in order to bulk. A single shake can get you anything from 20 to 50 grams of protein, and you can have two or three a day. But for those who just want to bulk and aren't bothered by how clean the bulk is, you can go one step further and use a weight gainer instead. This is a protein shake plus a huge amount of calories and carbohydrates to fuel you with energy and it often has other supplements like BCAAs, creatine, etc. as well. Do you need to take a protein shake or a weight gainer? Well, certainly not. In fact, you don't need any supplements at all. But you'll find it can be a real struggle to reach your calorie and protein goals otherwise. When combined with the right diet and the right training, this can be enough to really accelerate your growth and to help you get much bigger, much faster. And if you're new to all this, then why not set yourself up for a win? Of course, there are other supplements you can use for bulking too, though none quite so useful for game-changing as the shakes. One example of something worth checking out is creatine. Creatine is a supplement that is very popular amongst Olympic athletes and others thanks to its ability to improve cellular energy. It does this by recycling the ATP used by the muscles, ATP being the purest source of energy. And this allows you a few extra seconds of maximum exertion. This can be pretty helpful in the gym when you're going all out, but that's not actually why we're interested in it. Instead, we're interested in creatine because it also happens to have the ability to increase fluid retention in the muscles. When you consume creatine, it encourages the muscles to store more glycogen and water, which in turn makes them actually appear slightly larger. That's right, just by using creatine, you can actually see your muscles increase in size by about an inch. Then there are the other supplements. You have things like your BCAAs, which can help to prevent the breakdown of muscle. You have your things like testosterone boosters. And then you have your pre-workouts. While these can all help to some small degree, they're also expensive and quite complicated. The small amount of benefit they provide, as a general rule, won't be worth the time or the expense. And so, for that reason, it makes a lot more sense to stick with the protein shake stroke weight gainer and perhaps creatine. Don't bog yourself down with the rest unless you're starting to reach that genetic potential level where you really do need every last bit of help you can get. Oh, one more small thing I would recommend is actually to take some sort of multivitamin. We've already seen the importance of micronutrients. Vitamin C prevents muscle breakdown and may actually be one of the most overlooked contributing factors to muscle gain. Calcium helps to strengthen your bones, 
your connective tissues and your muscle contraction. Vitamin D improves sleep and boosts testosterone production. Yeah, the list goes on. And apart from anything else, when you're working out that hard in the gym, it really does pay to give yourself all the help you can get with regards to repairing your body and keeping your immune system strong. A vitamin supplement could be the difference between continuing your workout or having to take months off due to illness. So far, this has been a video series about eating. And so it should be. Eating is the key to bulking up. But of course, training had to come in somewhere sooner or later and unfortunately there's just no avoiding it. So how do you need to work out if you're planning on bulking? To answer this question, the first thing to consider is how exactly working out will add muscle in the first place. And the answer is that it can work through two separate mechanisms. The first is that lifting weights creates micro tears in your muscle fiber. In other words, the mechanical tension is great enough to cause tiny rips in your muscle that are too small to see or really feel, but which will trigger the body to make repairs. Then, when you rest later on, your system will use amino acids from your diet in order to restore those muscle fibers while also making them thicker and stronger in the process. The other way it works is by increasing the glycogen stored in the muscle. When you lift weights, this causes a buildup of blood which makes them feel swollen. This is what you may know as the pump. Along with the buildup of blood though, are a number of metabolites such as testosterone and growth hormone. This triggers more growth in the area too and leads to more glycogen being stored for better muscle endurance going forward. In order to stimulate maximum growth in your muscles, you need to do both these things. But at the same time, you also need to avoid training too intensely for too long. Now, this is a classic mistake. People who want to bulk up think they need to train more and train harder to do it. The problem is that when you train with great intensity for a long duration, you burn through a lot of calories and create a lot of stress resulting in the release of stress hormones like cortisol. This combines to put the body into a more catabolic state again and that thereby causes the breakdown of muscle, you know, just like being hungry does. So the key is to provide just enough micro tears and just enough metabolites to trigger growth and then to rest for the remainder of the time. This is what author Tim Ferriss refers to as the MED or minimum effective dose. And it's great news for you because it means you don't need to spend hours in the gym every day to get into shape. In fact, you mustn't. So the question is, how do you go about lifting in such a way that you're going to create those necessary triggers for growth? And the answer is that you should use isolation movements and drop sets. Not sure what they are? Well, keep watching. An isolation movement is any movement in the gym that involves lifting weights using only one joint. So an example of an isolation movement would be a bicep curl because only the elbow moves. On the other hand, the squat is a multi-joint exercise and so we call it a compound exercise. Isolation movements are currently not in vogue with the hipster stroke paleo crowd but they remain the very best way to create tears and build up metabolites. That's because they let you focus on just one muscle until it's completely exhausted. Conversely, when you reach failure in the squats, it'll likely be the combination of muscles that can no longer lift the weight with no one muscle group being completely exhausted. Isolation movements also allow you to lift heavier and for longer without risking injury. That said, compound movements have their benefits too. Because they involve more muscles, for example, they increase the amount of metabolites you produce on the whole. For this reason, it doesn't hurt to start a workout with some squats or bench presses before moving on to your isolation work. So once you're focusing on just one muscle group with a lat pull down, a bicep curl, a dumbbell row or a pec fly, 
then you need to make sure that you're creating both tears and the buildup of metabolites. But there's a problem here. Creating micro tears means you need to use a very heavy weight for a lower number of repetitions. You give up when you can't do any more reps and because the weight is so heavy this will likely have caused some muscle damage in the process. But to build up metabolites you need to occlude the muscle. In other words you need to redirect a lot of blood and nutrients to it where they'll pull and collect and the best way to do this is with a slightly lighter weight curled for higher repetitions. Try it. The former gives you DOMS, that's delayed onset muscle soreness, the painful muscles you get the next day, while the latter leads to the best pump in the gym. And that's where drop sets come in. This basically means you're going to train by starting out with very heavy weights and just doing a few repetitions. But then, when you reach failure and can't do any more, that's when you're going to drop those weights, move down the rack and pick up the next heaviest. You'll find that by dropping the weight slightly, you're now able to pump out a few more repetitions. And then you drop down again. And again. And by the end, you're barely able to lift the lightest weight in the gym and your arms will feel crippled. But this works like magic. That's because you're constantly challenging yourself and pushing through failure. But also because you're managing to lift the heaviest weights possible while still doing a large volume of work. Remember, there's no pause in between the drops. Drop three or four times, then rest for one minute and then start again. That said, this is just one intensity technique, yet there are others too. And these include things like doing pre-exhaust sets or pyramid sets. Either way, the key is to try and feel the burn and the pump. You know, if you don't get that feeling, then you aren't training hard enough. So that's how you lift the weights. Now the question is which body parts to focus on and when and for how long. As a general rule for bulking, you shouldn't need more than three days of training a week and perhaps four at a push. This way you'll have plenty of days to rest in between and you'll avoid burning too many calories or getting burned out and suffering with adrenal fatigue. The other good news is that each of those sessions need only last about 40 minutes. And each of these 40 minute sessions can include a few different body parts. If you're using a drop set, for instance, then three sets will be enough and you can then move on to other exercises for the same muscles. You might go from a bicep curl drop set to performing some basic chin-ups. This will further break down the muscle, but after you've completed this for about three exercises, you can then move on to the next body part. You'll find you can fit two or three body parts into those 40-minute sessions. And the key here is to consider how well different muscle groups complement each other. For example, if you're doing chest exercises, it makes sense to do triceps and or shoulders the same day. Why? Because a lot of exercises actually use these muscles in conjunction, meaning that going from bench press to shoulder press will somewhat pre-exhaust you for the latter. The best way to formalize this is with PPL, or push-pull legs. Here, you simply spend one day of the week doing pushing exercises, you know, bench press, shoulder press, press-ups. One day with all the pulling exercises, so that's pull-ups, shrugs, bicep curls, and one day with the legs. This is a fantastic split for beginners because it allows you to intensely focus on each muscle group but not entirely for one session. So 40 minutes of PPL, three times a week, that's your bulking prescription. So if you combine the exercises we've talked about with the diet we've recommended, you'll find it almost impossible not to grow. Of course, you may need to tweak your precise calorie intake or macros as we recommended before, but for the vast majority of people, bulking can be as simple as doing PPL while getting some more protein and carbs. And hopefully, 
You'll now know some ways you can do those things conveniently without too much disruption to your regular lifestyle. This is key because it means you actually stand a good chance of sticking at your goals. Finally, remember that your body is always going to be in one of two states. Catabolic, meaning you're anxious and burning muscle and fat, or anabolic, meaning that you're growing. We grow when we're well fueled and we grow when we're rested. So eat big, rest big and get big. The body is changing all the time. It's simply a matter of choosing whether we want it to change for the better or for the worse. Please remember that we are not medical doctors. This was created for educational purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. Please do your own research and consult a medical professional healthcare provider before doing anything mentioned in this video.